Matthew chapter 23 has 39 verses. You see, except the first verse, all the other 38 verses were the words that came out of the mouth of Lord Jesus Christ. So let us sit at his feet and listen to what he says. Verses 1 to 4, our Lord says, then Jesus, the, the, Matthew says, then Jesus spoke to the uh, multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. Verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. In these verses, our Lord clearly warns the crowds and his disciples about the scribes and the Pharisees. And as his children, we too need to heed to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to beware the leaven of the Pharisees. As we see in Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. That is, beware the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I truly believe that the words that we see in this chapter has great relevance for us today. We know that Pharisees were a distinctive groups of uh, Jewish leaders uh, who lived during the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. They originated with very good intentions. There is no doubt in that. They started with very good intentions. They were very particular about the purity of Jewish people living the life God had called them to live. They had a great passion and desire to learn the law of God, to live according to the law of God, and to teach the law of, law of God given to Moses. But sadly, these people degenerated into a group primarily interested in outward appearances than having an inward relationship with God. Most of these people became self-righteous and begotten. When we go through the Gospels, we can understand some of our Lord's harshest words were directed to these people. Most of our Lord's scathing denunciations were delivered to these people. Our Lord said these people were teaching as doctrines the precepts of man. They were teaching as doctrines the precepts of man. So remember, when we turn our personal opinions, our personal preferences into spiritual doctrine, we become like Pharisees. I have come across some Christians who talk about their own personal preferences, own personal opinions, own methodologies, as if those things were spiritual doctrine. By doing uh, that, they make themselves uh, as the spiritual authority. They think it is only their opinion that counts. Remember, when we set ourselves up as the spiritual authority, we become like Pharisees. And also understand, when we make rules that even we ourselves do not keep, we become like Pharisees. Verse 4, our Lord says, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. A pure hypocrisy, isn't it? When we go through the Gospels, we can see our Lord lashing out at these people on more than 20 different occasions. Go through this chapter, our Lord calls them hypocrites seven times, blind and blind guides five times, fools twice, 
serpents and brood of vipers once our lord called them hypocrites the word hypocrites meant a, a, a play actor being a hypocrite means that you are acting like someone that you aren't being a hypocrite means you are acting like someone you never intended to become remember god hates hypocrites when we go through acts chapter 5 we see ananias and safira being punished by death what was their sin that was a sin of hypocrisy so when we make rules that even we ourselves do not keep we become like pharisees then subsequently when we do what we do to be seen by others we become like pharisees verse 5 our lord says but all they do all their works they do to be seen by men they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments but all their works they do to be seen by men when we do what we do to be recognized by others to be noticed by others we become like pharisees there is no doubt in that these people did what they did to be noticed and recognized by other people such as blowing a trumpet when they were putting money in the temple treasury that is what we see in the sermon on the mount our lord himself says about that putting money in the uh, blowing a trumpet when they put money in the temple treasury walking around with a gloomy face when they were fasting and at the designated times of prayer these people used to stop wherever they are and say their prayers so that everyone can hear them no matter they were blocking the street and holding up the traffic and in verse 5 our lord says clearly that these people they make their phylacteries broad the phylacteries that our lord speaks about here is a little black leather boxes that contain scriptural verses from exodus and deuteronomy and these people strapped these boxes either to their forehead or to their left arm this practice uh, uh, came from literally reading deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 8 exodus chapter uh, 3 13 verses 6 and 19 so this practice came by literally reading these passages this they did uh, to show the to 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 flaunt their holiness we know such outward displays such outward displays are not are not the true barometers of the depth of one one's religious devotion that reference what i have told deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 8 and exodus chapter 13 verses 9 and 16 then in verses 6 to 10 our lord says that these people they love they love special places at feasts special seats in the synagogues greetings in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi rabbi and our lord says but you do not be called rabbi for one is your teacher the christ and you are all brethren and do not call anyone on earth father for one is your father he who is in heaven and do not be called teachers for one is your teacher he who is in heaven through these verses our lord says very clearly that in the kingdom of heaven we are all equal for we are all brethren and there is no place for any distinctive titles that sets one individual above the other 
Sadly, we see so many, in so many denominations, people are being called with different titles, like reverend, most reverend, father, mother, so many titles like that. It is clearly against the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says very clearly that in the kingdom of heaven, we are all equal, for we are all brother, brother brethren, and there is no place for any distinctive titles. In verse 11, our Lord says, and he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Our Lord, the servant king, is the greatest example for this. In Philippians, Apostle Paul says this, being God, he did not consider that equality something to be grasped. He, he emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation, took the form of a bond servant, came in the likeness of man, humbling himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Do we need any other better example than this? And in the upper room, when the disciples were arguing amongst themselves about who is the greatest among themselves, our Lord, he, he stood up, set aside his garment, took a towel and girded himself. And he started washing the feet of the disciples. Do we need a greater example than, than this? He says very clearly, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. In verses 11 and 12, God's, um, our Lord says, <coughs> who, He who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Our Lord says very clearly, those who exalt themselves like these Pharisees will be humbled one day. And his true disciples, his true children, who humbles themselves will be exalted in due time. From verses 13 to 36, then we see our Lord pronouncing eight woes on these proud religious hypocrites of his day. Eight woes. The word woe can be translated as cursed be, which is the exact opposite of what we see in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, blessed be. And here our Lord curses these people for, the, for their way of living. First one we see in verses 13. Verse 13, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against man. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are going to enter in. <clears throat> what a serious sin it is. You are shutting up the kingdom of heaven against man. See, you don't want to believe in Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the life, and the truth. You don't want to be saved. It's okay. That is your choice. You will be paying the price one day. There is no doubt in that. But abstracting others from entering into the kingdom of heaven, that is something God will not tolerate. Woe to you. That is what we see in verse 13. Verse 14, we see the second one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. See, this happened during the days of our Lord Jesus Christ and it still continues. We can see some of the cults some of the denominations trying to usurp the widow's properties, the unsuspecting, undiscerning, innocent widow's, helpless widow's properties. And in that process, making a very long prayer. 
Our Lord says, therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. You are going to receive a greater condemnation. Woe to you. Then the third one we see in verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell like yourselves. See, these people went to unimaginable lengths, traveling everywhere, converting to convert one person to a Jew and then to a Pharisee. See, these people wanted them to convert them to their point of view on all things. This happened during the days of our Lord Jesus Christ. It happens even now. There are some denominations that deny the deity of Lord Jesus Christ. They work very hard in the name of evangelism, knocking the doors of hundreds of houses to win some people, some innocent people to their faith. And our Lord says very clearly here, by doing that, they make them twice as much children of hell like themselves. Woe to them. That is what our Lord says. Then the fourth one we see in verses 16 to 22. Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, they are obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater. The temple or the gold that, uh, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And who say, whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater. The gift or the altar that sanctifies it. Therefore, he who swears by the altar, swears by it and swears by everything, swears by all things on it. That is what our Lord said. And he who swears by the temple, he swears by it and swears by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. When we go through these verses, we can see how silly and foolish these people were. They held that they were not bound. They were not responsible to pay vows sworn by the temple or the altar. But our Lord made it very clear to these people that all the vows should be paid. He made it clear that the temple is greater than the part of its material. And the altar is greater than uh, the gift that is on it. Then the fifth one we see <clears throat> in verses 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint, anise, and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These things you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. See, these people were obsessed with trivial. They spent a lot of time debating about tithes, giving tithes. And they made sure that uh, he, till the last ounce that they were to give us tithes should be paid. Thus, focusing on smaller things, neglecting the most important things of the law. Justice, mercy and faith. Micah chapter 6 verse 8, the word of God says, 
for he has shown you o man what is good he has shown you what is good and what does the lord require of you to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with him these are the things god required from us and uh, we know the legalists they are very concerned about details but sadly those people are blind to some of the great principles of the scriptures and i love the imagery our lord uses here wanting to avoid the impurity caused by a dead insect in their drink these people would strain out a bug before it would die thus uh, preventing them from becoming unclean but our lord says instead these people will put a camel in a cup a camel which was the largest land animal in palestine and which was ritually unclean in a cup and gulp him down so do not get caught up in the smaller things that we may miss out on the most important things then the next one number 6 we see in verses 25 and 26 who to use scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish and inside they are full of extortion and self indulgence blind pharisee first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also these people were like cups that looked very clean and attractive outside but inside they were full of greed and self indulgence if we have a cup in our home that looks uh, attractive and clean from the outside when you take something in it and leave it for a few days like that we can start we can see mold are starting to grow in that cup the cup which is attractive from outside the cup that looks clean from outside will be a breeding ground for fungus and bacteria what about these earthen vessels that we possess we 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 take lot of pain to make it clean to keep it attractive to everyone around us but what is inside this earthen vessels we can hide all those things from human beings from others because they look at your face they look at your outside but remember god looks at your heart nothing is hidden in his sight so it is easy to uh, focus on religious routines that we forget the necessity of cultivating a great relationship a deep relationship with our lord jesus christ instead of intensifying the internals we become expressing only the externals the next one the seventh one we see in verses 27 and 28 woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead man's bones and uncleanness all uncleanness even so you are you also outwardly appear righteous to man but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness in verses 25 26 our lord was using the analogy of dirty cups and dish whereas here he speaks about whitewashed tombs the subject may look same but our lord is speaking on a different aspect of that subject see once in a year just a month earlier than this passover celebration these people used to whitewash the tombs and all the places where corpses were buried around jerusalem this they did for two reasons first one out of respect for the dead the second one to prevent to protect the people from accidentally stepping on the graves of dead man thus becoming unclean so what our lord says here is as the whitewashed tombs these people were contaminating 
all those who came in contact with them, with their way of living. Our Lord cursed these scribes and Pharisees because they were spiritually contaminating everyone they touched. Their facade of external righteousness as whitewashed tombs only concealed an internal lawlessness that led to the contamination of everyone they touched. Someone said a mule dressed in a tuxedo is still a mule. Brothers and sisters, our God is more interested in the kind of person that we are on the inside than looking great outwardly. God wants hearts that are hearts and minds that are pure and loving because if that's the way we are on the inside it will be seen on the outside in the way we live and treat everyone but woe to those who are corrupt within then the eighth one we see in verses 29 and 30 woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say if we had lived in the days of our fathers we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets the veneration of the martyrs tombs was itself ironic because most of those people were killed by their fathers we can see that in the scriptures most of the prophets most of the children of god were killed by the religious establishment of that day and these people say if we had lived in the days of our fathers we would not have been partakers of what they did we would not we would not have been partakers in the blood of the prophets really what about lord jesus christ who stands before you you are going to kill him shortly he is the one whom moses prophesied as the prophet who is going to come moses told very clearly god will raise a prophet like me in those times you will listen to him and obey him are you listening to him are you obeying him he is standing in front of you he is the one all the prophets pointed out as the king of the jews as the messiah but you are going to kill him shortly not only him our lord says in the following verses these people were going to kill some of the messengers our lord was going to send the scribes the prophets the wise men and some of the people they were going to scourge in the synagogues and most of the people they were going to persecute from city to city that is what is going to happen and thus these people would heap to themselves the accumulated hit accumulated guilt of the history of martyrdom and all the blood of the righteous people shed on this year right from abel to zechariah that we see in second chronicles chapter 24 verse 20 onwards who was stoned to death in the courts of the temple for speaking the word of god all those innocent blood that was shed on this year would come on this people that is what our lord says in verse 31 he says very clearly fill up then fill up then the measure of your father's gift father's guilt 31 he says therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets fill up then the measure of your father's guilt and the next verse lord says serpents brood of vipers how can you escape the condemnation of hell what a serious question that is serpents and brood of vipers 
how can you escape the condemnation of hell many people say god is love such a loving god cannot send human beings to hell he cannot allow the human beings to perish he cannot allow the human beings to die an everlasting death it is impossible for him to do that because he is love of course he is love there is no doubt in that but god is holy you should never forget that he doesn't take sin lightly he doesn't put up with sin sin is a slap in his face sin is a rebellion against god he will not tolerate that he is love he is holy he is also just the sin must be punished there is no other way scripture states very clearly the wages of sin is death that is the punishment the wages of sin is death the soul that sins should die that is the law of your creator that is the law of the creator who made everything and who holds everything by the power of by the word of his power but he loves you so much that is why he opened a way of salvation for you because he love you so much he opened a way for you to come to him to escape from that destruction john chapter 3 verse 16 says very clearly for god so loved the world that he gave his only son only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life he sent his son into this world to take your place to take your sins upon himself and pay the price on the cross of calvary that is what happened 2000 years back in jerusalem he paid the price so god who loves you so much he opened the way for you to come to him he opened the way that you may not perish and you may get eternal life all you have to do is believe in him believe that he came for you believe that he loves you and because of that love he gave his only begotten son for you lord jesus christ came for you came to save you and he stood in your place bearing your sins upon himself and he paid the price believe in him accept him as your lord then it is god's promise that you will have eternal life not only that you will be you will become a member of his family you will become his child it is his promise otherwise the scripture states very clearly it is appointed to man to die once and then comes the judgment don't think that you are going to be born in this world again and again so many times those are all tricks from satan those are all tricks from the pit you are going to die once and then comes the judgment you cannot escape from that you can either accept lord jesus christ or you can reject him but you cannot ignore him don't forget that a day is going to come that you are going to be judged according to the choice that you make in this world here our lord asks these pharisees and scribes serpents brood of vipers how can you escape the condemnation of hell these people knew the truth they knew the word of god they knew everything but they were not willing to accept him as their messiah they were not willing to accept him as their king that is why our lord says to these people how can you escape the condemnation of hell subsequently we see in uh, verses 37 to 39 our lord says 
O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, our Lord was weeping, literally, as we see in the Gospels. He was weeping over Jerusalem, weeping over his people, knowing what was going to happen to these people. He loved them so much. He had chosen them to be his children. He wanted to be their God. He physically dwelt amongst them. And he wanted to speak to all other nations through these people. He wanted these people to be an example to all other nations. Even though they failed so many times. Even though they turned their faces away from him so many times. God had forgiven them again and again. He had shown his mercy to these people again and again. But these people would not repent. He says very clearly. How often I wanted to gather you gather your children together as a hen gathers her cheeks under her wings to nurture, to protect, to take care of her. But you were not willing. The next verse he says in 38, see your house is left to you desolate. God was going to abandon these people. For a brief period. God was going to abandon his chosen people for a, for, a, for a brief period. That is what he says here. See, your house is left to you desolate. Secular historians say, you know, within 40 years of our Lord uttering these words, Jerusalem was completely destroyed. The temple which was the joy and pride of these people, was reduced to a small ring pile of rubble. Jewish historian Josephus, who, who, who lived at that time, says about that, the, the siege laid to Jerusalem. How horrible it was. Things were so bad. People were so hungry. And Jewish women were fighting amongst themselves over who would get to eat the flesh of their children? Shocking. It shouldn't have been. God predicted this hundreds of years back. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 47 to 57. He prophesied it in detail. When you disobey me. These are the things that are going to happen. See, there is a certain limit to iniquity. And when that is reached, judgment comes. That is what happened in the lives of these people. See, your house is left to you desolate. God abandoned them for a brief period. But it never ends there. In the next sentence, the last one, our Lord says, For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For I say to you, you shall see me no more. This is the last time our Lord was addressing these people. Shortly he was going to be killed and these people would never see him again. Till his second coming. After his resurrection, only the chosen people have seen him. He appeared to his people, but these people did not see him. A day is going to come. At the end of great tribulation, these people are going to see the Lord again. This was also promised that he is coming again. These people uttered the very same words, Blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord a few days earlier, 
during the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. And in a few days, in a few, in a few hours time, these people would cry, would, would shout, crucify him, crucify him. And it will come to pass that at the end time, when they go through the great suffering, great tribulation, they will be crying to their Lord for deliverance. Our Lord is going to come. And these people will see him in their own eyes. And they will utter the very same words. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God. This is God breath. It is a challenge, as I told you on that day. You know, it is a challenge to all other, other, other gods, all other false gods, all other nations. Show me the things that is going to come, that I may believe that you are gods. This is full of prophecies right from the beginning till the end and we can see all these things happening one by one the heaven and the earth may change but the word of god will never blessed we are to be his children though we never deserved this he loved us he showered his grace upon us and made his children and he speaks to us through his words, how thankful we should be to him. And what a good life that we should live for him. May the Lord help us to live a life that is pleasing him and that is fruitful to him. May the Lord help us to do that. Let his name be praised forever and ever. Amen.